Philip Falk, welcome. Yeah. Welcome to this uh, extraordinary interview um, being conducted from Darkest Cheshire <laughs> on Zoom. And, and you're in, in Darkest Buckinghamshire, is that right? Dark, the Darkest Buckinghamshire and the Chilterns. And the Chilterns. We talk about dark, but on a radiantly sunny evening. Um, and it, it, I can't tell you, it's absolutely glorious. And I've just returned from a long walk um, with a, a former student of mine. I think you may know him, Alex Aitkin. He used to work. Yes. At, uh, anyway, we've, we've enjoyed a walk. And this is what I've been doing in these lockdown weeks. Um, I've been longing to do it for years. And now I've got time, combined with the lockdown, I can go for these long, mostly solitary walks. Um, and, uh, of course, this week, my dear wife, Liz, was to have come from New Zealand, but she's locked down in our house in New Zealand. So I'm, I'm, I'm not able to do that. So I'm, I'm making do with my, my family and dear friends and, and former students who've been very attentive to me. And um, so that's what I've been doing, Mary. Were, were you, were you um, singing John Ireland in your inner musical ear when you were walking? Do you, do you hear the English pastoral tradition as you're walking on a summer's day? Or what sort of music do you have going on in your head when you're out in beautiful countryside? In the Cowpat School of uh, Music. Yeah. Um, I have to confess, Murray, and it, it may shock people, but possibly not those who know me well, I, I don't hear music at all in my head. Uh, what I do enjoy very much is just, just listening to, to the sounds. Which, which are tremendous all around. And it always amazes me, I've reached that time in life where I really savour uh, all my prejudices and uh, grumpiness and irritations. It's one of the great pleasures of getting older, I can tell you, it's something to look forward to. Um, and that is when I see people jogging, um, or not necessarily jogging, but they have earplugs, you know, something in their ear. And I think, how can they block out just this marvellous stuff going on around, but, but it's curious. It seems to be people are, are fearful of listening to the beauty of the sound that's around us. It's, it is amazing how, uh, well, it's horrific how we can get so caught up with the stresses and the strains of, of, of doing what we have to do and what we feel we, have, we shouldn't miss out on. And so perhaps, have, do you feel that the past few months have been positive in some ways for your, your um, mental health or for your reflections on life? Well, the thing is, Murray, in a way, this lockdown is what I've been longing to do for about 30 years. Um, and that now that one has, a, I've reached a point in life uh, where I've got a sort of legitimate excuse to, uh, to do the thing that we were all being urged to do, which is, you know, to, to, to stay where we are and not go out and about too much and all the rest of it. But it, it suits, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable on my own. I mean, I miss my wife, of course, but in general, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy alone, and um, I enjoy silence. Um, I wrote an article years ago, it was in my 40s, when classical music first came out, and I called it The Sound of Silence, because even then I was very concerned that we were entering a very noisy age and people were constantly wanting uh, distraction and sound and I noticed today Murray and I rather you know not that I watch television very much but those programs I do enjoy watching uh, are documentaries of one sort or historical documentaries or sometimes natural ones and they the, um, and ones on architecture too but it's I can I it's spoilt because of this constant musicalization I call it I don't even call it mm. music it's constant musicalization um, to clearly sort of enhance what's going on to the average viewer and watcher. But for me, it makes it intolerable. And I just have to turn it off. I don't know what it is. It's a sort of obsession. The radio do it too. Um, program trailers now with all this sort of urgent music. Even the news, the sort of urgency. Everything has this urgency and pressure. And I think this reflects on all our lives. And... I have to say, also very much in, in, in one's teaching. I notice over the years, as I'm sure you have, that the students are uh, under great pressure just through social media, I think, and, and life in general, but social media in, in 
but the constant pressure to be on call the whole time, always something to do. I don't know. I think that, you know, when I look back to the time when I was at college and Gordon Green, I'm sure you can do the, the similar thing. But it was just a very, as one looks back, a very reflective, a very peaceful time. There was the pressure of getting ready for a lesson and one wanted to do it. And there was, one could do it without interruptions, without festivals, without too many competitions, without endless assessments. And, and you could just get on with, with, with the matter in hand. And I feel we've rather not taken our eye off the ball on that one. Well, everything has to be done within the next five minutes or it's old news. And it, it seems to be very, um, you know, rather like fast food, doesn't it? Everything has to happen at once. And we're used to getting instant reactions. Whereas, you know, in the past, it might take a couple of weeks for a piece of music to arrive. Now, you know, it, it arrives on our doorstep from an internet provider, you know, hours after we've ordered it. And, and uh, I know. That, which is extraordinary, but it does... You know, you know, beggar the question, are people losing the ability to take time? I mean, how many people read long Russian novels anymore? Well, <laughs> I don't know about long, but uh, I would actually say, can, do people read anymore, really? And I would even bring it down, down to that. I think one's, you know, constant distraction is, is very worrying. And I, I you know, I, so often in the past, well, not the past, but not that I do quite so much teaching now, but often I hear a student play, and it's it's all right. It's well prepared. It's it's appropriate stylistically. It's it's accurate. It is the score is broadly sort of um, uh, understood and all the rest of it. But I feel I sometimes say to people, what I want to hear that was fine. But what I want to hear is the silence. I want a bit more silence in the, in the playing. You know, I want to hear the. I always like to say to people, you know, that music is, is, is a tapestry of sound woven on a loom of silence. And we, I feel it's just so in your face. I just want to hear time between notes, the, the rests, the placing, you know, all the stuff that we talk about so often. But it's really silence, the urgency to move on. We, we avoid savoring the moment. I think Arthur Schnabel talked a lot about the space between notes and Benjamin Britten a lot about the power of rests and the silences as well. But that's lovely to hear. Um, but, I, you know, you, I have to say, you know, it's wonderful um, to talk to you now because you're about to have a, a significant birthday. But it has to be said that Benjamin Franklin, um, when he reached the particular age we're talking about with you, said that life begins at that age. And... Yeah. and <laughs> I would, I would endorse that um, very, very strongly. I mean, given certain facts that one, you're not, you know, begging on the streets and that, that you've got food in your stomach and, and all these things. Um, but, and of course, your health, more than your health. Let's never take that for granted. But having said that, um, yes, you're, you're right, Murray. And, and for me, and in some ways, I was rather... I won't say dreading this this thing. I was, I was thinking now, God, what am I going to say? Because so many things I really want to say, I, I'm rather fearful of saying. And I, I take refuge in my little column, for example, behind <laughs> fictional characters because <laughs> I feel that they're, they're the mouthpieces of all the things I'm really wanting to say. But, um, you know, this, this the, whole, the whole music business, the whole that we are, the side that the, 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 the way I, I feel it's become very frantic uh, and pressured and um, I, I like to say to people who, who, who ask me you know what am I doing uh, sort of expecting me to say well I've got a recording project and I think now I've got time I'm going to learn all these pieces actually no I've I've have no piano at all now. I've got gosh my, really? I've got rid of all my pianos most of my music I've given away uh, many of my recordings, I've kept, I, I've given my 78s to a student, a former student who's interested in that. Um, and the sense of relief and release is, is uh, calculable, actually. 
and um, I have a keyboard. That's that's I, I, that's all, uh, and I don't use that very much. For example, the, the Stevens piece which he wrote for me um, very kindly, which touched me immensely. I, I enjoyed just pottering that because it's it's a it's a lovely piece as you've heard, and it was a, it was a pleasure to learn and. But also, it was, it was not as though I was sort of learning a whole concerto from memory and all that sort of thing. It was a, it was a, it was a comfortable and pleasurable learn. Um, but, you know, people say when they're young and they do well in the grades, for example, they might say to their teacher, you know, I, I want to be a professional musician. I want to go professional. I, at the age of 70, am saying to people, having had a long period in my life, working with adult amateurs, as you know, I've enjoyed that. Really, that's been the, in some ways, the richest part of my musical life. I have reached a point where I'm going, I'm turning amateur. I'm turning amateur in the sense that it's just f for pleasure without any pressure. Well, it should always be that way. I mean, it's very inspiring and you're being extremely yeah. humble. I have to say, you know, we're talking about um, Stephen Hoff, one of the, one of the most dynamic, um, multi-talented geniuses before the public today, who's, who's written a fantastic um, sonatina nostalgica, especially for your birthday. Yes. Um, a beautiful piece, but you have played it incredibly uh, vibrantly, really with full confidence, joie de vivre, elegance, colour and dash. And it's, it shows a pianist at really, really huge skills and abilities. And, I mean, you know, I mean, recently, you know, I, I look back with great affection and, and, and memorability on, on your Grieg concerto in the Stoller Hall, played mm. immaculately, and so many other solo performances, not just incredible sizzling encores by Billy Mayo and others, but also remarkable performances of pieces like Schumann's Carnival that stand up and really remain in the memory for years afterwards. I mean, so I, I would suggest that, that you've had at least three lives uh, before this birthday. I mean, massive amount of achievement. I mean, I mean, just to go r right back, um, you know, and, 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 you know, I mean, the first time I heard you play, which was bowled me over live, was Rachmaninoff's fourth concerto at the proms with Simon Rattle and the CBSO, which was a, a, an absolutely um, hugely bravura performance with great confidence and conviction and really taking the music and making it communicate with absolute lucidity and positivity. And it can be a very difficult piece. Um, I mean, what, what, what I wanted to, to ask, first of all, which I think we should do is to look back um, on your, your concerto career. And, and um, what was the first time that you played with an orchestra? Well, uh, the first time I played with an orchestra was at school. I went to boarding school and I did uh, uh, the Bach E major. Well, it's the violin concerto. It's, it's been transposed into E. And I, I did the first movement of that, I remember, and loved it. I enjoyed that. But then, more significantly, um, I did, the Greek was one of my first ones. But I think even before that, it would have been, I think, Rat 2 with Simon the young Simon Rattle oh, with the, the Merseyside Youth Orchestra. And that would have been in 1973. And I got a tape of it somewhere. But, um, and, and in the Philharmonic, Liverpool Philharmonic Hall. And, and that was a, a, a wonderful experience. And then shortly after that, the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra, which was a great orchestra, mm. orchestras at that time when they really were being encouraged. Sadly, we live in different times, but in those days, there was tremendous funding and support for these um, youth orchestras, county youth orchestras. And the Leicester show was right at the top of the tree and people like Andre Previn were, were conducting them. And they were playing works by um, um, Tippett, I remember. And I was asked at very short notice uh, to do the Pagnini Rhapsody. That was in 1973. And I had, because uh, they were taking it on tour to France and um, the the academy, I was still at the academy, um, got hold of me and said, Philip, would you like to do the Pagani Rhapsody? That's the good news. The bad news is it's in three weeks' time. And of course, I was young. And so I, I learned it in three weeks. And um, uh, it became really one of my mainstays because I think I've played that. Uh, uh, 
a former student of mine's catalogued all my numbers of performances, but it runs into something like a hundred times I played that. Oh, it's a very famous performance. I've heard you several times on Radio 3 playing it and, and with great bravura, great uh, strength and character. So, so it, it, that's, uh, that's one of your really most famous works. But I mean, you've played Chopin concertos, you've played John Ireland. I mean, it's a huge range. I mean, how many concertos did you? Well, I, I do. It is somewhere in the region of 70. Mm. Um, and uh, it was a curious thing. I mean, the, 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 I look back on my career, such as it was very, very intense it was in a sort of 25 year period. And unlike, I think some people I could mention, well, Stephen, for example, of course, I was, I was very unstructured. Um, I, I, I just um, did what I was told, really. I had no particular plan about anything. I just, if, if an orchestra asked me to do something through the agent, I just said yes. And went off and got the music and learnt it. <laughs> and I think Moura Limpany said that one. She said that if, if it was until it asked if she could play a concerto, she would say yes, then go out the next day and buy the music. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> um, that's exactly what I did. And that was fine up to a point, but it, 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 I think, especially in this day and age, one does need to be much more structured and planned and sort of have five-year plans and all this, this kind of thing. And I encourage students to always plan their programs in a very structured way because I didn't. And it, the trouble with that is that you do sort of learn in a rather, um, well, a rather pressured way. I remember there was one year when I was literally playing a new concerto every month. It was almost yeah. every month. I learned about 12 concertos in 12 months. It was, it was, and there is a price for that um, under, and you see, I mean, you mentioned Rack 4, which was, which was a great, I'm not too ashamed of it when I've heard recordings, but that was a one-off. I learnt it from scratch to prom with no preliminary performances, just first performance was Gosh. that one you heard. And it got marvellous reviews and everybody seemed very pleased and I never played it again. Because it sounded to me, I sat near the front, by the way, as a listening, it sounded as though you'd been playing it all your life and there was great confidence and authority. I mean, did you do a lot of conscious kind of visualization or positivity before it? Or was it just all practice, practice, practice? Or? No, no uh, what I did do, and I was very conscientious about it. I had a lovely house, a rather legendary house in the East End, a big studio, but I used to do uh, run-throughs on two pianos. Uh, Hamish Milne often used to play the second piano orchestra part. Um, uh, him for me and me for him too, when he was doing things. Craig Shepherd was another one I used to run things through. Oh. That was hilarious. If we could get to the end of the first, without <laughs> collapsing heaps of, you know, after. Um, but I did a lot of that and invited an audience. So I did do a sort of quasi run through, which I think was a valuable thing to do. Um, but, but the, the Rack 4 was a one-off, and I would have loved to have done that, but the one concerto, the one concerto, I grieve that I never played, was the Rack 1. Oh my goodness, yeah. I really feel oh. I had something in me to do, do oh. that. And um, I, it I never came my way, I wasn't, never once, not once. And I would have, I think, more than any of the others, that's the one I would have loved to have played. And of course now I couldn't. Well, maybe you will. Who knows? I mean, <laughs> well, I'm not because um, I make no secret of the fact that I'm not playing anymore. Oh, nice. well, it, it's it's partly because I literally can't because my hand has given out. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, you've got such a tremendous legacy um, that we can all listen to on YouTube and, and the recordings and on Spotify and, and, and uh, you know actual recordings yeah. we can still get hold of, which are fantastic. Yeah. I mean. We must talk about your mentors and, and teachers. I mean, Gordon Green, presumably, was one of the most important influences on your life. Absolutely. But before then, Murray, uh, I was immensely fortunate because um, I went very early to a wonderful teacher. I was seven, called Marjorie Withers. And she was um, just a, the local teacher at Gerrard's Cross, where I live. Um, and... But, but she was a laureate of the Royal Academy of Music back in the 1920s, had been. And she was taught by a legendary figure who uh, he wouldn't be known by people now, but he was called Percy Waller, but he was well known in his day, Percy Waller. And um, 
she was she was a fine pianist and really had all the equipment to to, to have made a career, but she uh, got married. Well, you know, she didn't have children, but she she married um, the head of strings, uh, Bertie Withers, Herbert Withers, who was a very well known uh, cellist, and uh, he used to play in the Griller Quartet, which was quite a well known quartet of its day. Um, and they lived in Charles Cross. They'd moved out to Charles Cross just before the war, and I. Uh, had the good fortune to go to her, and she, she really did give me a tremendous grounding. She she was really very particular about exercises, scales, and ingenious ways of practicing and fingering and all that. And she really did set me up, I think, very well. And when I went to Gordon at the Royal Academy, and I felt very very inadequate right at the beginning, right as, as I did right at the end, and probably ever since. But he used to say to me, when I used to say to Gordon, well, have you any tips for practicing? Dear boy, I don't need to talk to you about practice. You know how to do everything. Um, oh. And I remember thinking, it's not, not true. I have to work terribly hard. Uh, but he thought it all came very easily. And he said, you're so inventive. And, all the rest of it. Um, and at that, perhaps I am, I, I, I do enjoy certainly helping others and, and um, breaking rules is one of my particular pleasures. Mm. Well, well, we'll get into that later, but from Gordon, uh, what, what did you learn? Was it, was it mainly Gordon, Gordon style was, or? I think it was that. I think particular, he, he, he was, his fascination for color and for sound in particular. I think those are the things he gave me. Also, he, he educated me in, in, in a, in a I, I knew nothing. I don't know that I know very much now. But he, he educated me in, in musically. I was musically very illiterate. I think I was quite, possibly quite gifted, really. But he, he really educated me musically. Um, and he used to spend a lot of time, so generously, having me and one or two others, Christian Blackshaw, I know, used to go, and Stephen Huff, the young Stephen Huff, to his house when he still lived in Liverpool and we used to go and stay you know for two or three nights he wined and dined at Dorothy's club because his wife ran this wonderful sort of arts club uh, the 23 club 23 Hope Street between the Philharmonic Hall and Gordon's Palace and um, he used to spend oh I don't know as much time playing records as we did working at pieces he was so keen that, that I should hear as many great artists and legendary recordings as he could possibly find time to, to play to me. Sounds wonderfully inspiring and, and also um, generously um, hospitable, really, the spirit yeah. of Franz Liszt in a way. Indeed. Yes, it, it, was, it was. It was a sort of salon. And going to the club, I mean, that, that was extraordinary. I mean, you just didn't know who you would meet. I remember seeing Adrian Bolt dining, he just been conducting, he was actually dining alone and he, he finished and there he was. And I was sort of rather starstruck. And, uh, but uh, they all went there, Rubenstein died there, I know Richter used to go there, they were all sort of friends of the Greens, Dorothy and Gordon, and it was, it was really quite a, quite a place. And I, I suppose at 19, 18 or 19, I, I didn't fully take it in, but it was, it was a, a piece of history. And also Liverpool, I mean, if I say the 60s and the Beatles and all that, it was very vibrant. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we talked about concertos, but in terms of um, recitals, like when you look back on, on, on solo concerts that you've given, um, what was the first um, major concert? I mean, did you do a Wigmore recital? Did you do the did, yes. me I... legendary debut? At the... <laughs> yes, the legendary, it used to be like that. Yes, I did do that. I, I never was very successful in competitions. I, they, they weren't my thing. Um, and, but I did win a, 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 what was called in those days, you may remember it, Murray, the National Federation of Music Societies. Mm, it's now called the Dorothy Green Award. So it's still running in a format, but it's much, much less public than it used to be. I think. Oh, right. Well, it was yes. quite a big thing in those days. And mm. the, um, one of my distinguished... Uh, uh, colleagues who, who, who'd won it just before me was um, John Barstow, 
Mm. Yes, he won that. He was one of the. But I, I, I remember the finals were up in Glasgow, and Charles Groves was conduct um, adjudicating, and I was, I think the last of three or four finalists, whatever it was. And the piano had gone fearfully out of tune, dreadfully jangly out of tune. And then, as now, I always have a tuning crack. And it was sort of generally known that I had, and so uh, it was so out of tune, Charles Grove said, look, Philip, would you, would you like to just, just check on the notes because they're so terrible, really. So I went and, and did that and got a round of applause and played and won. And so I don't think it was my playing, it was my tune. <laughs> But having, having said that, um, it was sponsored by the Arts Council, I think. And one of the prizes was, of course, a season of music club games. Um, and a Wigmore Hall, all paid for and advertised, which is a big thing in those days. Mm, fantastic. Uh, and so I did that. And I, uh, and it, because I was thought that was the thing to do. It's not that I particularly wanted to do it. It's mm. not, Joy recitals, although I sort of um, train myself to think that I did. Gosh, but what was it—the loneliness of being a solo pianist that you didn't like? Or, yes, or... I think that, um, and uh, just, just just the the, the, the recital nature of it—the sort of playing one thing after another. Um, it, it's 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 never. I've never been really truly comfortable with it. I think concertos have always suited me because you're on stage for you know, half an hour, generally as a rule, possibly a little bit more from time to time, but and then you're done and dusted and go back home, have a stiff whiskey and have an early night. Um, and that suits me much better. Uh, just, uh, just short, sharp. I don't like to be in front of people too long. I'm, I'm, I'm quite good at it when, when in the moment, but I'm always sort of, I always remember somebody saying, and I can't remember who it is, you might be able to tell me, but one of the great things, I sometimes say this jokingly to my students, one of the great pleasures in performing is when it's over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's such a relief. It's such a relief. It's, it's a relief if it's gone well, it's a, it's a pleasurable relief. And if it's gone not so well, it's still a relief that that torment has come to an end. Oh. But you're being terribly modest as usual. I mean, I've heard you play so often, particularly at Cheatham's in the summer school, when you've done, you know, maybe five encores in succession. And there's been such a great obvious, I can't believe that you weren't having a whale of a time and playing, you know, amazing, scintillating, sparkling, you know, moving encores and having such joy, not wanting to go away at all. You know? Yes, but that is because I, I'm savouring the moment of relief. Oh, it's, 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 I'm sort of coasting along, 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 along mm. on a press that it's now I can enjoy myself kind of thing. Mm. It's, it's been a little bit of, um, I, I wouldn't say a millstone, but throughout my career, I've, I've been, it's always a joyful showmanship and, and all this kind of thing. He's a pianist, pianist, whatever that means. That's rather sinister, but it, it, I, it, it's always been the case. I remember with dear Craig years ago, you know, he, he's really performing and he needs to perform. Um, and I, I, how can I say, I'm as happy performing as not performing. You know, I don't feel, I don't have an appetite to, you know, so often I remember that Nina Kay was a wonderful agent. Mm. Used to say, now Philip, what do you want to do? And she was very frustrated. And I never really knew. I never really knew. Well, wow. perhaps I should do some British music. And uh, it was Ruth Gibbs who got me onto um, British music because Gosh. she, uh, and she's been in the news recently. I saw something about Ruth Gibbs on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the piano concerto I was on Radio 3 on Sunday then. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Viewing you. Well, Ruth Gibbs wanted me to do that. But at the time, she said, Philip, I would like you. She ran a thing called the London Chanticleer Orchestra. Mm. And we, I knew her as Wid. And she, um, well, I don't know why she called herself Wid, but that was her sort of name, Wid, W-I-D. And she said, Philip, you ought to do the Bliss Piano Concerto. Arthur was still alive and um, 
and all the rest of it, and Trudy, his, his wife. And so I, I learned it. It was a good date, and it was at Croydon, the, the Fairfield Hall, and uh, with the London Chanticleer Orchestra. And I, you know, dutifully said, yes, would I like to go there, and went out and bought it. And I couldn't believe it, it was a straight, thick tone. They've had a page after page of dense piano writing, and I thought, what have I done? What am I doing? Anyway, I sort of went through it all. And then I, I, I realised about three or four weeks before the concert, I, I, I realised I just couldn't memorise it. It was just not going in. And I phoned up Ruth and I said, Ruth, uh, it's, it's, I, I, I can play the note, but I, I really must use the score. I hope you don't mind. And she said, poo, poo, Philip, you're going to do it with the music. Bye. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was that. So I did it from, it's one of the biggest things I'd ever done from memory, and it's a tricky piece. It's un unbelievable, yeah, but your recording comes to mind at once, and that extraordinary opening, which really grabs, you know, yes. the attention at once, amazing, and, you know, it really is a very yeah. notable achievement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I did it on the radio. I've, I've got, mm -hmm. I'm going through some of my cassette off-air things. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to digitalize because the BBC probably junk them um and i've i because i was rather hoping the bbc might do because my career was mostly on, on the bbc but there's also a wonderful chandos C cd of you doing the complete solo works of bliss isn't there oh, not complete but co quite and most of them the sonata and, and the you know which is very impressive and sounds like again it you seem to have the knack of playing everything as though you've had it uh, in your fingers for many seasons, you know, and it's all very unfamiliar music, but it sounds extremely confident and authoritative. I'm, I'm enjoying this Zoom very much, because it's <laughs> a lot of things to me. I mean, you just feel free to even Zoom me as often as you like. <laughs> it's like this. It's, 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 it's a great pleasure. But I did play that, and I did champion it um, for many years. I would have I would have liked to have done that at the proms. But that didn't. Um, uh, and I would have loved to have recorded. I mean, there's certain things recording. You mentioned recording. Mm. I loved recording. I think more than, in a sense, performing in public. I really loved the microphone in the studio and uh, doing complete takes and possibly a bit of patching. But I like the, uh, the I love the feeling, the luxury of well, get one in the can. Now we can get down to business. Mm. Um, and I really loved that. And I felt absolutely, I had a lot of recording in me. I don't know whether it was me or what, but it, it didn't happen. But I have got a lot of off air stuff, which I'd like to thank you. I'm sure there'd be many people would love to hear. I mean, I remember lots of recordings, the Tchaikovsky concertos with Wilfred Bircher uh, at, done at Fairfield. I remember the Chopin waltzes you recorded as well. Yes. Uh, you know, some fantastic, I mean, and also a legendary recital at QEH with the Chopin waltzes in the first half and the Rachmaninoff second sonata in the second half. How do you know about that? Oh, <laughs> it was famous. You know, people talk about it still. Very, that, a wonderful that, program. That was, that was quite a program and I, that, that was one of the, it's funny when people, you know, in, in, in sort of um, occasionally will say, what was your favorite concert or, you know, that kind of, and I don't really remember anything very, very much. I, I'm just sort of walk away from the scene of the disaster kind of thing. Um, but that is one that I did, felt I did a reasonable job on. And Shora Chikaski was there. And I, in fact, he came backstage uh, I don't know how it was, because I didn't know him about that time. I never quite know how I met him. But anyway, he came backstage and I was having a party. I le then lived in Pimlico and I was having a party at a, 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 there and I asked him to come and he came. And that was wonderful. And that was when he said, I, I just feel it was, I, I like to think that this, it was, a, he came up to me and said, Philip, and that's a rather drawly camp way, are you English? And I said, well, oh, yes, sure, I'm certainly. Are you sure? <laughs> I said, yes, I'm quite sure, sure, I'm English. You don't play like an Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I sort of oh. felt, rightly or wrongly, that that was some, 
Um, and don't misunderstand me because you're well, you're Scottish, so you're you're. Of course, I'm all right. <laughs> but um, I think he was. Um, I was rather touched by that. Oh, wonderful. Well, no, as I say, you know, you've done such a lot, and I mean, you have had more influences other than in England. I mean, you you went early on, didn't you, to New York for lessons of? Uh, yes, with Rosalind Turek. Yes. Um, and that was. I didn't make the best use of that. I was. I was. I was rather. In, in awe of, of Rosalind Turek. I, I had an American friend, a pianist, sadly he's no longer with us, but when he heard I was going to Rosalind Turek, I always remember him saying, oh, Rosalind Turek. You know what they say, Turek or not Turek? <laughs> <laughs> well, she was formidable with her authority in Bach. And... She was as formidable as a tiny little miniature dog called Petenia. A savage little animal who hated me on sight, um, but she she was she was remarkable, and I've listened subsequently to quite a lot. She got there's a lot of stuff on YouTube, and uh, she's talking and lecturing. And, but she really was quite something. She was ahead of the game at about that time. She used to give recitals. This is back in the seventies. Um, you know, she'd play the Goldberg variations on the harp scored in the first half and then to play them all again in the second half on, on the piano and also on the um synthesizer the moog Gosh, so, really she had no she had absolutely no qualms about playing things on electronic developments of the day and of course she would have been thrilled with what's happening now but when i think even today and particularly sometimes with students you know they just won't practice you know they, they think it's rather demeaning to practice on a keyboard. There must be a Steinway to get back soon. And I always wag my finger at students. I say, you must make your keyboard sound like a Model E Steinway. And that applies to any instrument. It's got to be that you've got to play any instrument. There's clapped out village hall piano. It's got to sound the most beautiful instrument you've ever played in your life. And if you're not prepared to do that, you're in the wrong business. Absolutely. It's not the instrument, it's the artist. And, and I do, I do feel that. And, uh, so, but but she she had a she did have an influence on me. Um, I I was I was a bit frightened of her though. Um, um, she was a tremendous anglophile. She 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 really wanted to be, I think she wanted to be English, and nothing gave her greater pleasure than being. Um, she she got a honorary doctorate at um, Oxford, wasn't Oxford it? University, yes. and that gave her immense. And, and justifiably, because she was, I always felt a little bit, a little bit, I won't say suspect, but her scholarship, I used to wonder about, and I, 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 I'm not a scholar in any way at all, I run on ignorance and prejudice, um, but, um, and instinct, very important ingredient. Uh, but actually, I, I think she really was remarkable for her time. She really did go back to early sources, original sources, and you know, she came up with some interesting stuff. I think that what's remarkable about, about you, if we return sorry, to you, you again, what's wonderful and perhaps is the reason why you're not so um, devastated or desperate to play the piano in public every day is because the piano is maybe only one part of, of your incredible talent. I mean, it's amazing and that we have the privilege in EPTA UK, the Piano Teachers Association, to enjoy your wonderful um, articles, uh, folk muses, every every issue full of fun, but also full of, of real insight. And, and underneath the humour, a lot of very important pertinent points and sensitivity. So maybe your writing and your, your thoughts and your, above all, your wonderful um, motivation to help other people as a great teacher, you know, is, is something that, that shows the, some of the, the, the wide ranging in interests of the piano Recital is maybe only a small part of, of small. the whole Philip folk, you know. It's a very interesting thing, you know. Um, are we all right for time, Murray? I mean, We're absolutely fine. It's fascinating hearing what you have to say. The thing, the thing is, and in a way, Zoom, in fact, the whole business of um, this lockdown and the way we're communicating, I feel that I can feel another muse coming on on this one, has, has raised many, many very interesting questions. For example, I've been asked by the Royal Welsh and also by the Royal Northern, but the Royal Welsh I've already done, 
to do the assessments, the online assessments for this round. I, 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 I was the external examiner for the statutory three years, but they, they asked me back to do it online this year. And, and I, I agreed. Um, and the students sent in their recordings of, of what they had to do, and we had all the criteria stuff sent online. So we could, and the examiners and, and had to listen once only, and I was, a, I was good on that, I did do, do that. But it raises so many issues. You'd have one student playing on a clavinova, another one booked a room in the college and managed to do it, you know, to social distance on a, on a decent concert instrument. Same degree course, the same um, criteria. And you, we have to listen and make a judgment and blind mark, you know, things that are coming from, and all, so I think that, you know, without any training, without any experience of it beforehand, and listening at home, wearing whatever it is that you wear, knowing that you can put the pause button on, put the kettle on, or not, not that you necessarily do, but that you can, it's the whole ritual of performance, the whole ritual of examining, and it is a ritual, there's a whole liturgy around it, what you wear, you've got a vest for, for the thing, and you know, put on a, a, I, I like to put on a tie myself, I just feel all these things are immensely important, mm. immensely important, and I think that we've got to uh, take all these things into account. You know, this is a very, very interesting stage. I don't think anything is going to be quite the same again. How we listen is, is, is you know, listening at home on a screen. It's not how we listen in an exam. Absolutely not. And I think, as you've said before to me in the past, it's, it, there's something rather unhealthy about listening to 12 hours solid piano music, one after the other. And, and I think there ought to be a government health warning. I mean, I think a lot of the examiners and a lot of musicians, including ourselves, mm. need to be sort of counselled and have therapy after all these things. I, it's not, I can't do it and I, I can't, I just simply can't do it. And the same applies to teaching. Um, I, I think people, and I've got to be careful what I say and to whom I say, but I've sort of reached a slightly reckless age. Life begins at 70 and you can say what you like at 70. Um, but I think people teach too much, too hard. And Liz, my wife, who's a wonderful teacher of strings and yeah, in particular, strings in general. Um, I remember years ago, we, we shared many things, but and we both felt that we spent quite a lot of our teaching careers over teaching. Mm. And I call it, I call it grooming. And I see a lot of, not what I, I think it's dressed up as teaching, but actually it's grooming. It's en enabling people to play. And a Gordon Green used to say something very interesting 30, 40 years ago. I can remember him saying it in room 41. Dear boy, the trouble today, and this is 40 years ago, is that too many people play too well too soon. And I think that is immensely wise and immensely true. But we've forgotten that. And I see many of my very distinguished and beloved colleagues hard at it. And I feel just chill out, cool, cool, cool off. Leave the poor creatures alone. You know, don't, don't force mm. them. Don't, don't hot house them. Let them develop in their own time, or not. Well, I mean, you've been remarkably successful at doing that with all sorts of uh, students, uh, many students over there, not just conservatoire students, and not just young pianists, but. I mean, adult amateurs particularly, and it's very touching to see you helping and supporting pianists who may have um, not the most um, dashing or reliable techniques, but who do it for a love of music. Um, what is it that particularly attracts you to teaching adult amateurs? Well, I, I, th I think you, you've said it. I think that the joy that people have the thing, the many things here, uh, um, Murray, one of them is this awful misconception, the difference between the word amateur, the word amateur is, is, is so pejorative. But the other thing is that talent comes in many forms and it, it is ageless. 
That, that is a terribly important thing. We tend to equate talent with youth. And this is just not so. Um, it, talent can be in a 90 year old, their old fingers can be doing amazing things that actually are in a way more amazing than somebody who's nine years old. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so I think that's one thing. The other thing is the joy of enabling some, someone to do just something that's troubled them for 30 years, 40 years, they just couldn't, couldn't do and they were frightened of doing it and they're nervous and why do I get so nervous and all this stuff. And you just say, well, look, leave that note out. Can you leave that note out and then you can put that if you put that up then now try it just think about it just do a bit of rewiring you don't have to practice it just think it leave that out second on f sharp think it through i do it and they do it and they you can see tears in their eyes i could never play this well, I think you give you you give so much hope and inspiration and uh, support and encouragement to so many um, pianists of all natures, particularly at, at Cheatham Summer School. I've come in contact a lot with your with your um, pupils, and, and, and you know I think you've got such a tremendous amount to offer in so many ways. So I mean, we you know like to wish you a, a wonderful birthday, um, and uh, we just hope that you won't vanish completely from England and, and, and we hope that you'll no. continue to, you know, show us all the wonderful things in different forms that you can show us all and share with us. There's such a lot that you've given us, but I'm sure many, many more possibilities in the future. I certainly hope so. We're looking forward mm -hmm. to the, the Stephen Hoff Sonatina and your, your recital um, in the Cheatham's Online Academy, but um, what sort of hopes or, or projects could you envisage um, tackling in, in, in the future? Well, Murray, that's, that's a nice way to sort of uh, end this wonderful talk about. Um, it's something I've been wanting to say that you're, you're very generous about what you see as the things I'm able to do. I remember years ago when I was beginning to get some big dates. I remember particularly with my first prom. And I, I, I went to my mother and who was a remarkable woman, um, a very gentle soul. And I wanted to share with my mother, as one would do, you know, I'm getting these dates. And she said, and she was often quite away with the fairies, but she said, uh, oh yes, dear, hmm. I never thought music was your main talent. And I always, I, and I remember feeling two things. I don't know this retrospectively, but I, retrospectively, I can analyze the confusion and disappointment I felt at the time when she said that, because I wanted something slightly different to that. But I knew then that she was right. Um, and that in a way, because I, I mean, design, I designed this house in, in, in the East End, which I, I lived in for 23 years. Um, architecture, a very interested in the church, as you may or may not know. Um, and and all those sort of things um, come to me in a way more easily, in a way more easily. I, I, I've got to be careful what I say, but, and also I think I could have done a bit of writing in some shape or form. You're a wonderful writer, Mary. My goodness me, when I read your stuff, I don't know how you get the time to do it. I mean, we ought to turn the tables. <laughs> I mean, I've done nothing fiddling my thumbs compared to what you've done. I mean, you talk about repertoire. You gobble it up whole. I mean, I just don't know how you do it. And from memory. It's no, not at all. But I, I, I mean, I, th I, think, I think, you know, you've got such a tremendous legacy of, of achievement that you've, that you've given us all. And I'm sure, you know, just to talk to people would be inspiring and motivating. And, and you know, we sincerely hope, you know, that we'll continue to see as much of you as you can there to give us because it's always a great privilege and well, joy kidding. and well, you, know. I, you know I enjoy cheating so it's one of my annual fixtures I always oh. love being with my adult amateurs we have a, a lot of fun and pleasure oh. well thank you so much for everything that you've given us and and we look forward to seeing you again hopefully in in the flesh and not just online uh, we hope that 
lockdown will eventually stop. Okay. Not but, virtual reality, but real reality. It's yes. for real, that would be the thing. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I look Lovely forward to talk. Thank you. Happy birthday when it comes. Okay. All the best. Bye. Bye. Bye.